Thanks everyone for joining to actually what I consider the most unintelligible title in the entire Reinforce. <laughs> uh, my name is Joaquim. I'm going to talk actually, I'm the head of global security at OLX Group. My background is quite diverse. I managed to actually do quite a lot of different infosec domains, especially in OLX. I was a developer, then security researcher, then moved to product security, application security, SOC, compliance, cloud, Terraform, et cetera. Uh, the goal of this talk actually is to talk about how we build a PCI SAC AAP compliance service, but actually that is easy to deploy, that is serverless and easy to maintain. Why is it important it's easy to maintain? It's because when you look at the last, for the last six years, according to Verizon, we were actually doing okay for the PCI, or we were improving the amount of compliance, although not the best ones, but we're still improving, and the trends were going up. This year is the first year where actually we're struggling again with PCI. What does it mean? Is that actually over almost half of our companies have or are struggling to maintain PCR towards all the year, and we fail the controls in the middle of the year while we actually are, while working. It's not a one-time picture and then after. Uh, what's also important that when we do get audited and we think we're ready, we, uh, the average is that we miss 16% of our controls on the gap when we fail. And even it's interesting that now by 11 points, almost half of our companies are using compensating controls in any way, and we're not what we would call PCI by the book <laughs> in that way. And hopefully with this talk, you can actually uh, try to struggle uh, to improve this trend. And also the other goal is that we managed to be PCI. What we started was, was a year goal uh, in a product, and then we reduced it by going this new architecture to less than three months. Hopefully you can achieve the same results and you can build on top of our successes and failures of using AWS to build a PCI serverless uh, framework. First, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the context. What is OLX Group and why we actually want to become PCI again. Then a crash course on PCI. How many, can you raise your hand? How many have you implemented in the past PCI or have knowledge? Okay, so a lot of you. So I'm going to go with a quick two slide crash course in that way, uh, just to refresh on the amount of controls and what level you need to be. Then I'm going to talk about, about our first approach we try to do, uh, because I consider it's sometimes a good idea to talk about your failures and what didn't go so well for us. And then we move to actually the change and we did, how we changed our scope, how we changed our strategy, and how we actually, by going serverless, we chose to, we were able to reduce to a lot of the months that we were going to implement PCI. Then again, some tips, some takeaways, and, and the last stage, I'm going to talk about, I'll give you some time, 10 to 15 minutes on QA. And the rated breakout, uh, there's only one talk I would say that is really connected to PCI. It's about uh, how to properly scope PCI DSS on, on AWS. I think this is a really key talk you need to go because what you get from this talk is actually, this is critical. If you do it wrong, you're going to pay a lot, and a lot of time is going to be wasted and change your architecture completely. So some of the context about OLX Group. So OLX Group is actually part of a invest bigger investment company it's called NASPERS. They're a South African-based internet and entertainment group, and they've been founded in 1915. They have investments across the entire world. Uh, they are in fintech, e-commerce, iFood delivery, education, uh, a lot of other places plus OLX Group, which is a classified site. When you look at OLX Group in numbers, you see that we're placing over 40 countries. We are what some people call one of the biggest companies you never heard of. We are actually connecting over 350 million users every month who are customer buyers and sellers who want to actually trade safely using your products. We are running across multiple tech hubs Barcelona, Moscow, Russia, Berlin, Buenos Aires, Delhi, Poznan, Lisbon, and that we are running over 35 offices. We have 5,000 employees, over 1,000 are plus and tech. And in that way, it's uh, quite a big group. We are comprised of many different products and companies. And as a head of security, I actually work 
in helping them become more secure and more compliant, where is ENISA, GDPR, PCI, etc. I'm helping most of these brands that way. What, one of the tips and tricks that is not related to PCI is on these bigger companies with multiple stakeholders, multiple business units, etc. One of the key things you have to work on is security culture, as it was explained today also on the CISO, plus uh, the partnership program about how to partner with the different products that we're running and so that they see security as an enabler rather than a blocker and somebody who's just saying no to them all the time. In terms of PCI, what I would say is most of these products do have uh, or allow customers to uh, pay via credit cards. We mostly use third-party providers for this. So you can use a lot of uh, third-party providers, Adyen, Ingenico, Stripe, etc. Now, there's a myth. The first myth of PCI is that when you use a third-party provider, people think that you, you don't need to be PCI anymore. And that's not true. Your scope, your, your risk exposure is going to be reduced, and, but you're still going to have to take care of PCI, DSS in a easier way probably, with less amount of controls, but something that you're going to have to look for. That means that most of our products had to implement PCI at a certain level, and what we ended up doing a long time ago was each one to their own. They would implement PCI multiple times. And then eventually we realized it's better to centralize using a shared service capabilities, and that we build once, we deploy everywhere, and that way, is the new product that we wanted to talk about today is about how to build this shared PCI service that everyone can use and implement it once and probably with higher PCI requirements than the rest of them. On crash course of PCI, again, everyone I think had a, has a lot of experience here, at least some experience. So it's a security standard uh, that is uh, to ensure that your company's process that process credit card information, maintain a secure environment. The standard is actually maintained by an independent body, the, the payment uh, related, and actually the, the, that independent body was created by MasterCard, Visa, etc. The people who actually enforce are not, it's not this independent body, but actually the payment brands and acquirers. Well, if something bad happens, they're going to try to, they're going to probably find you in that way. And that is important to take care of. Now it's a standard. What does the standard mean? What do we need to comply? When you think about it, there are two things that it says. One is the amount of controls that you need to implement. You can go really easy with integrated providers, and you're going to have to have, a, if you go with Redirects or iframes, which are the easier way to implement PCI, but also the less customizable version of PCI, you're going to have to implement only 22 controls. And this is really easy. Now. If you actually want to have JavaScript or direct posting, and you want to actually be able to customize your user experience better, you're going to have to implement 191 controls, which is much higher than 22, but you have a better customer experience, and you can change a lot of your flows. That is much better. Now, if you actually want the full bank for PCI, you're going to have to implement 250 controls, and that is a large level. Now, those are the controls but it also makes sense to see uh, the assurance level that you have to implement. Depending on the amount of transactions that your merchant has or your product, you're going to have to implement multiple levels. Some levels means that level four is lower amount of transactions. You're just going to go by via a self-assessment questionnaire that you've signed and you give, and even the quarterly scan of your network and your product is going to be recommended and required. If you actually have to level two or level three, you are mandated to the ASP scan. This is a scan provided by a third party that is approved by PCI. But actually, if you're level one, now you have an auditor on site that has to validate all these 22, 191, 250 controls. In that way, OLX is mostly using SAC A at, at that point. Now we're using SAC AAP. Um, some of our sites are level one, so we need to work with an auditor. Now, what I mentioned is we wanted to build it once. We don't want to avoid having multiple products doing the same work all over again. This is also 
has a lot of other benefits. Instead of working with multiple payment service providers or PSPs, we can use it, uh, we can centralize most of them, we can avoid local contracts that is really painful, and we have much better partnership integrations with them, and even perhaps better discounts. Uh, we're also going to be able to centralize the PCI requirements, so it's going to be easier for security, easier for all the products, because now they have less PCI to take care, and win-win for everyone. But it's also, it's about the customer. Why? Because by centralizing this payment flow and this credit card processing, we allow for faster deployments that reach all of our customers, and then this allows us for a better customer experience that we can implement across the entire portfolio that we're running. So we wanted to implement SAC AAP, 191 controls. Our first approach is we choose to, as many companies do now, is we wanted to implement a Kubernetes, this PCI SAC AAP on a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, at the time, it was 2017 almost, 18, at the beginning of 18, it was quite new. There were not that many companies that were doing it. But OLX were running a lot of cl clusters, uh, Kubernetes clusters in production, and we felt quite comfortable with the technology. So I said, okay, we wanted to invest, we actually implement the PCI there. But when you actually look at how does PCI looks in a uh, Kubernetes cluster, you start realizing that it's not actually 191 controls only because what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to map it to the multiple layers that you have with your architecture. So you think about it, you have the Amazon layer, the account, the EC2 layer or the operating system, plus the containers running on top. And a lot of the requirements are going to be mapped multiple times across all these layers. So it's going to be get harder. So for example, access management wise, we're going to have to implement an Amazon layer, we're going to have to implement on the SSH, plus also, the Kubernetes and the Docker containers are going to have the access management also be checked. On the network firewalls, the network ACLs have to be properly configured, the security groups as well, plus and then we're going to have to have a cluster that has network policies and we can restrict the pod look, uh, mapping across everyone. But not only the technical controls, this is something you do once and then you are done but also the operation controls. This is something that you have to maintain and you keep, have to keep doing every time. Now you have more, more login and monitoring to do. You have CloudTrail, you have the operating system logs and you have the Docker and the, the Kubernetes logs that you have to monitor for security purposes and make sure that you react to all of them. On the patch management side, it also gets complicated. You don't only need to update the nodes or whatever other services are connected to the Kubernetes clusters like Vault for secrets or Wasu Elasticsearch, but also you're going to have to keep the pods updated also as well as scan them periodically. On the management side, this layered architecture also becomes quite problematic because you have to keep diagrams of everything. You have to do a CIS benchmark of everything it moves. So the, the Amazon EC2 or OS operating system CIS benchmark, the Kubernetes CIS benchmark, the Amazon CIS benchmark, you're going to have to change management, so every change needs to be tracked, documented, etc. And with all these moving layers, what ends up happening is it's a lot of changes that you need to work on. So for us, what ended up happening is the tooling team, who was actually in charge of building this new product or platform, uh, was getting frustrated because what it at first was a three to six month project, it started to look like a year with all these controls framework, and they never got it through. The SREs who were actually going to operate on this platform afterwards were also getting quite frustrated because they saw the amount of operational workload, the patch management that you had to do, the firewalls you had to review that you have to keep doing every six months, and they were not quite happy. <laughs> and for us in the, in the security team, we saw all the risk exposure, all these layers that could go wrong, all these controls fail, frameworks that we had to verify, that we have to hopefully automatically check. There, it was quite hard for us. And what's worse, it was 2018, and PCI was announcing new changes. And, uh, and they were doing things like, now we have to enforce SSL across the entire, or TLS, a strong TLS, uh, across the entire architecture. And Amazon was the first time that a lot of people had these requirements of Shun, so we actually had to troubleshoot our way out of this. So when all of this happens, sometimes it's good to go back to square one and see the payment flow. Uh, and component-wise, it's quite a simple architecture. We have a front-end that is a React application, and this time was Kubernetes, and we had a back-end that was Kotlin. The back-end 
we keep the tokenized cards on, on RDS, and we will keep the uh, NSQS with integration with the provider or products, actually to make sure that we notified once the payment was done with the providers. We send the, we would forward things to the providers, actually fully encrypted from the minute they reach the browser. So our backend never had actually nothing to do with the entire payment flow. The, uh, the public key was always the public key of the PSP. So we had no way actually to change this and no way actually to access that private, uh, public than the private key. So here, when we realized that, and we talked with our auditor, and we realized the scope, here came our first silver lining on all of this. Is that because our private key wasn't available by or accessible by our provider, by OLX, what happened is that our backend, the Kotlin app, was out of scope. And this is why I say you always need to talk with your auditors to understand what is our scope. This was also based on new changes that happened with FAQs from PCI that he based his assessment. What did this mean? No, actually, we only have to take care of the front end. And we need to make sure that the integrity of the front end is always there. So we make sure that the payment flow is done processing properly with the proper keys, etc. Now, a front end is easy, right? It's a React application. What we can do? We can run a React application in a bucket. And that's where we develop what we call the new strategy is PCI on a bucket. What does it mean is we're going to implement 191 controls on an S3 bucket. And the, that way uh, is going to be much simpler. It's going to be serverless, and it's, uh, but it's not out of the box. Because even an S3 bucket, <laughs> although it's PCI compliant, has a lot of things that you have to do all around your Amazon account to make it PCI. And this is what I'm going to talk about today, how to make actually a simple S3 bucket with all the front end and the payment flow actually PCI compliant. So uh, remember, we have 191 controls uh, that we have to implement. And the, across, usually, they're divided in six, doma six domains of on PCI. I'm going to walk you actually to the six domains and what it means on this simple architecture and actually uh, what it doesn't mean anymore. So first of all, the architecture got well, way simpler. What was a three-layer architecture with 100 million points of risk failures that could be exposed. Now, on PCI scope is quite, the attack surface is quite reduced. A lot of the controls are now shifted back to Amazon. So, DNCs, uh, network policies, uh, patch management, all these kind of things you're going to push into Amazon. The default users, insecure ports. By doing this, all these things move to Amazon. And what's better, we minimize the operational overhead and the management. A lot of less paperwork or checks that you have to do, but there's still a lot of management. And you're going to have to do no patch management whatsoever if we keep to these rules that we worked on. So how it looks like at first, it would look like this. But if you start, you will see, OK, we have to implement secure network systems. Now here, you have one of the biggest gains. Almost 20 or 25 controls, you shift into Amazon responsibility. These are all the ones I've said about insecure ports, and DMV files, etc. We still need to implement configuration standards, so we implement infrastructure as code. We run Terraform across all of our 110 Amazon accounts, so this is not quite something new for us. And we orchestrate since, I think, three years, so we're quite good at it. We're going to have to implement our own CIS benchmark. Now, just Amazon CIS benchmark. There are multiple ways you can do it. You can use a third-party provider, such as Nessus. You can use an open source tool, such as Prowler, where you can even include other custom checks that you think are good for your baseline. Or now you can also use Security Hub with Config in that way, if you're not running multiple regions and you would want just one score. Now, this is a new change that happened in 2018. We need to implement TLS 1.1 for our administrators. And here we came with our first challenge, real challenge. When you scan, actually, Amazon endpoints, you will see that TLS 1.0 is enabled. What does this mean? It actually goes against what PCI needs you to disable and to disable the fault. But Amazon has a good justification for this. They actually 
want backwards compatibility for TVs and all Android devices because they cannot distinguish between PCI and non-PCI environments for us. So when we talk with them, they gave us two options. They say, uh, disable the TLS on your workstations of your administrators or security so that you can ensure that there's no fallback. Or you can implement an infrastructure CI-CD because uh, this will then you can enforce a no fallback on the CI-CD. But then the infrastructure CI-CD would be in scope. PCI was quite clear, actually, that we need to disable any fallback with TLS 1.0. So we took one of the recommendations from Amazon, and what we end up doing, or similar, is we use a compensating control, because there's no way we can go around that one. Uh, we use a third-party federated access system that would enforce uh, the TLS on during the authentication, and we do it via a security account, same as we did with all the 100 Amazon accounts. And that way, we would ensure that all the workstations would have TLS 1.2 at least enabled, and therefore, they would always fall back to a more secure protocol. We chose to actually connect it to a security account so that the payment, pro the payment SREs could switch between staging and multiple accounts because we were running 100 Amazon accounts but also so that uh, it had a trade-off. What is now? It's in scope. Now the security account is in scope. And this is one of the things that you know, because it's providing security services for the PCI account. And so in that way, we now have to actually ensure that this PCI also is ensured here. On the car, protecting the cardholder data transfer or processing, we have to do three things. Again. TLS 1.1 or above needs to be enforced on the communication uh, between the bucket and the users. We're going to have to implement uh, or enforce HT HSTS, so we implement HTTPS always, and we're going to make sure that we, all, we always use the secure ciphers. Again, all these things we cannot do only with the bucket, so what we're going to do is we're going to implement a CDN that can do, do that for us. For us, it's Akamai. Now, how to actually maintain a vulnerability management program? The first item you have to do is you can choose. There's only one option in PCI that is an OR. That is actually whether you want to scan quarter, uh, quarterly or yearly or after any change your application to see any vulnerabilities and kind of verify your AppSec problem and that it complies to PCI. Or you can choose to implement a WAF in your CDN. We chose to do that because it's way easier. It's such a technical control. So we move manage, okay, operational overhead to technical controls. We're going to have to implement security gates. Uh, usually in OLX, we implement uh, world rails. So we let developers deploy sometimes, but within a certain limit. But PCI is more strict, so we're going to have to implement actually a gate that says no, yes, based on your deployment. We use only open source tools, so everyone can use them. First, Sonar queue for SAS. There we're going to implement dependency check also from OWASP to actually check the dependencies of our application. And there we're going to run TAST or say OWASP actually as well here. On staging, we can actually do whatever we want because it's not PCI scope, so you can implement a full CI CD pipeline. But uh, there would, if you connect to production, it would be in scope. So what we're working on is actually a hybrid because we want to have a full CI-CD part, so we work with code commit and, and code build. The challenge is that because code pipeline is not yet PCI, we cannot have the full pipeline still on Amazon, and we implement a hybrid between GitLab, code build, and code, uh, and code commit in that way. When code pipeline and code deploy are fully PCI, we're going to blend the full pipeline here because it's segmented, it's quite technology, and we can prevent all these other steps also in Amazon land. How to actually implement strong access management is one of the other reasons why we have to implement Octa federated access management. First, we need to implement a root token for the root account. That is quite easy done. You need to buy it, etc. But now you realize that there are three controls that you're not going to be able to implement in Amazon 
out of the box to implement all the PCI requirements. These are account lockout, idle sessions, and lockout durations. The rest can be implemented by Amazon, but these three can't. So this means actually you're going to have to implement either a single sign-on by using a third-party provider using SAML, like Okta, or you're going to have to implement an active directory to, uh, to make sure that you comply with all the PCI requirements. Again, you need to also ensure that you use roles. So for us, we have the security and the SREs who have access to the environment. Security have security audit, and the SREs have certain administrator access to that environment. And the monitoring and logging, there are three things you have to do. Logging, monitoring, and retention. On the logging side, first, enable the cloud trade audit logs so that you can keep track of everything that's happening in your environment. Most of the, these things are logging and monitoring we do via uh, Terraform baseline that we deploy to all the Amazon accounts, and you can do also via uh, Control Tower when you build a new account. So what I recommend is try to start with the baseline and then move up. We also connect War Duty with third-party open source like OTX and Talos, and we aggregate all this to a security account. But we also need to be keep in mind that we need to, things to keep uh, the logs live for 90 days. So there's a requirement for PCI. For that, at that point in time, when we build the PCI cluster, Elasticsearch from Amazon was not PCI. So we actually had to implement uh, another third party, which was Logs.io, so that actually we could implement PCI without having to keep servers running. Also, in order to have a certain kind of file monitoring capabilities, you're going to have to turn on the access logs and the object logs for the write. To say, okay, when I change fishes, you want to make sure that at least it's a build and a deploy being run instead of something that's random. On the monitoring side, uh, what we are using, same as everyone, is CloudWatch and Lambda to actually either alert us or automatically remediate any of the findings that we're running. Those are running from the security account because we also do those same things across the other 100 accounts that we're running. We, what do we need to ensure that we check? The CIS benchmark alerts. Some of them don't make sense, like BPC changes, there's no BPC. But the ones that do make sense, we are going to have to implement. We're going to have to implement any WAF monitoring and reacting to those things. If you're using Akamai, it's going to be harder to integrate with CloudWatch. If you're using CloudFront, it's going to be easier for you in that case. And again, any object logs updates, you need to remember that when it's a deploy, okay, I want to make sure that it's a right full deploy and nothing being changed on the front end. On the retention side, actually what we're going to implement is the lifecycle policies. So what PCA does require is that we keep uh, for the logs for more at least one year, and then we can move them offline. The way we do it is that logs.io, we are centralize everything, and then we move them back to archive, and from there, we move them back to Glacier after a year. But actually, we could remove them after a certain amount of time. On the governance side, this is the last of the domains that we need to take care. This is about actually AWS artifacts. When you look at AWS artifacts, you realize that you need to download at least the AOC from Amazon. This is a station of compliance that tells you which Amazon services are compliant and why. And you also going to have to implement a review and at least understand the responsibility metrics that says what Amazon is responsible for and what you're responsible for. Because also this is also really important that you keep track and you keep updated every year along with your actually agreement when you sign for an Amazon account. You're also going to have to implement incident management. There's, again, this is already a lot of things with CloudWatch and Lambda, but on the management side, it's more about uh, the process itself. So there's a new security incident response guide that was launched recently. I highly recommend it. It's about the entire process, how to automate, how to do simulations, how to react, how to actually uh, do any war rooms, etc. Uh, what I do also recommend is that because it's PCI, whenever there's a data breach, you do need to notify the credit cards that this happened because they need to be aware even the reply. 
So with that in mind, that's all the things that you have to do in Amazon, but there's still some things that are left that are management or non-Amazon ways. The firewall review is something you have to do every six months. We have no firewall, but we use it just uh, to update the list or the IP list between Akamai and the S3 bucket. So it's just a reminder to do that. If it's the CloudFront, that's not needed because you don't have a whitelist there. You have to have an annual pen test. The benefit here, because again, everything is serverless, you can actually focus on application flow. And you need to remind all the network segmentation, all the patch management, all the data, and not. Focus on the application flow and focus on what matters, focus on the business. And last but not least, the ASB scans are completely mandatory. You're going to have to scan Akamai endpoint and the bucket every quarter, and you're going to have to store the reports and send it over them. Now, sadly, before this, we have laptops. Uh, the security and SRE team are running, need to run firewall, patching, antivirus, and monitoring for all these kind of things uh, because they are in scope. If the payment SRE gets hacked, he can access the environment, he can change something. So that's why all these things are in scope, and this is the only pseudo non serverless thing we have for now. On the management side, nobody's going to write security policies for you, and these are quite important for PCI, but you can buy them. Uh, you have to do the trainings for the developers once a year. You're going to have to train them for OWASP and all these kind of things, and you have to have security awareness trainings for the entire company, especially in the policies. The diagram will look like something that I shared today on the architecture, and you have to, have to keep updated with all the payment providers that you have running. And you're going to actually have to keep track once a year, but it's something that you have to do, of your service providers that you're running with, uh, with Amazon, Okta, Lux.io, or any of these service provider, ask them for the three things. The agreement, or the DPA, the AOC, the Association of Compliance, and the responsibility matrix. Because you need to keep track so that they know that they're responsible for PCI as well, and they're PCI compliant. On the change management side, uh, some things, some, some, okay, when there's a really major release that affects the payment flow or you implement a new payment provider, this is something you're going to have to also look for and see if you have to run a new pen test, a new file review, or do anything again, because these big changes do affect PCI. With that, actually, what I do recommend is scope is critical. As you saw today, you can realize that the scope can change your architecture completely. And in that way, uh, first talk with an auditor before actually going full bang on PCI, because that's the first thing you need to do. <laughs> Second of all, it's by simplifying architecture, we managed to reduce, again, from one year Kubernetes cluster that we're going to implement with almost 600 controls, to something that's really easy to implement. And now we actually, if we want to move one level up with SACD, we can just put an API gateway or a Lambda, uh, we are fully compliant because it's easier to extend it. We will never go to actually do servers again because okay, this is easier. Now, uh, the other thing is PC, uh, the QSA, so the auditors don't bite. <laughs> they work closely with them. Don't take them as a one thing static picture and then go back six months, and say, are we PCI there? And then go six months, etc. Try to have the first assessment, know your gap and work on recurring calls with them, hopefully weekly by weekly, so you see continuous progress on whether you are PCI or not, and you see continuous evolution on this, and it's more a CICD with your auditor. And also, it would make sense, it will, you will be able to involve him in critical discussions and actually move way faster. Also quite important, Amazon is not, it changes every day. There are 100 million things that we have to do that now perhaps we can review. So for example, we had to use third party provider because Elasticsearch at the time was not PCI. So now we can use Amazon Elasticsearch in order that is also cloud and serverless uh, to keep track of the alerts. Also EKS is now PCI, but doesn't actually mean that you're not going to have to implement all these 191 controls over the three layers. It just means that you can use it, but you have to, going to have to work a lot to implement it. Again, other things that happen is now with API Gateway, you can choose the TLS version that you can use, 
because before if you only have, were able to use TLS 1.0, they were not PCI. You can actually now use Security Hub with your benchmark checks. And again, keep always updated because all things change in Amazon and you can always evolve and try to do less work and put more work into Amazon. On the resources side, I think it's quite important to see the FAQ. Why it's important? Because it says a lot of the questions are really commented about the TLS. Why does Amazon have TLS enabled or not? Why, what services are PCI compliant? Which ones I can use and which ones I can't? This is really to get start from scratch because as soon as you start diagramming your architecture as perfect and really beautiful, then it doesn't match reality. And you need to wait for the Amazon to pay the gap or actually for you to change the architecture. There's also a really interesting documentation about how to implement PCI on a, with servers, but let's say with BBC, et cetera, that is made by Initium and the workbook. So if you want to go with the full server approach and OS, et cetera, they have even you know, AMI that you can launch and are hardened in that way. And last before least, <laughs> Do read the AOC and the responsibility metrics. They are really long documents, but the responsibility metrics is quite clear. And this is the, the agreement between you and Amazon that says, okay, what you're expecting from them and what actually you should look for. Again, the reference side, I think it's quite clear. It's, there's a lot of how, how to make PCI, how to achieve, et cetera. But I think, and again, how, what it means to actually enforce TLS, et cetera. So in that way, I managed to get it quite quickly. So we can have a lot of questions or move to other sessions. <laughs> questions? In that way? So, so if you have questions, you have to speak up because I can't hear anything. In <laughs> scope. Yeah. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit more about that? And, uh, yeah. So the way it, the, I, can, I cannot go back on that issue. So how it actually works is there was this FAQs that got launched also in 2018 that talk about what does it mean for data to be in scope when, or PC, uh, for PCI purposes when you don't have access to the key that encrypted the data. This was also taken for backups, for example. Should the backups be in cough itself be encrypted or not? So what I like to say is, right now, the key is uh, rendered by the browser. Uh, the browser would use the key from the provider directly. The key would cipher, well, actually, with a symmetric key, and then use that with a, a public key from the encryption, and then send it to backend. The backend actually has just a hash or a, a full CS cipher that's fully encrypted. So there's no way, actually, there's no risk in that way. So you can just move forward. If you had direct post, it would be the same. You just send it to a provider, just nothing in that way. So that way, what the other to say is there's no reason why the backend should be out of scope. Uh, it should be in scope. And what we did is we could move the backend to another account. We can move it with all the other pods that are uh, Kubernetes cluster, or we could run it on EC2 instances. We could do whatever we wanted there, just because it was not in scope for PCI. And this simplified quite a lot of the architecture and the compliance part of the topics. And again, this is quite something that you need to work with your QSA, and you need to understand the payment flow and the credit card transaction. So if this kind of methodology is called client-side encryption. If you use something different, like the reposting, perhaps your backend should be in scope. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, I think we got it done with uh, 20 minutes in that way. So thanks a lot for the talk. I hope you actually learned <laughs> something new. And if you like to implement these kind of things, hopefully you can achieve similar results and reduce the amount of work that you have to do in order to implement PCI in your products. Thanks, everyone.